You've been talking quite a lot about uh, MDR TB, but uh, we were discussing uh, diabetes and TB. What have you done with bidirectional screening? Bidirectional screening is important in many places. The Pacific is uh, most important. We found that uh, almost six out of ten Pacific Islanders, uh, adults, with TB are also uh, uh, stricken with diabetes. So managing their diabetes is really uh, the rule, not the exception, in terms of managing TB in the Pacific. What are your thoughts about how that should be done? Well, the uh, initially, uh, I think, um, being able to diagnose their diabetes is, is the first challenge. And, and uh, so all of our TB programs in the Pacific are uh, checking uh, TB uh, for those TB patients are checking diabetes to make sure that uh, we know uh, that people who have TB also have diabetes because about up to half of them uh, don't know that they have diabetes. In many ways the tuberculosis becomes the diabetes defining illness actually. But more than that, more than counting them, I think uh, the TB programs have taken on some responsibility for managing the diabetes for that patient. With, with more than a hundred visits between our DOT workers and the TB patient, we want to use that time to uh, help that patient understand their diabetes and control their diabetes. And very briefly, what are the practical issues it took to make that work? Because it isn't easy, is it? No, it's not easy. And uh, it's not traditional work for TB programs. So we have uh, done some, several innovative steps. We, you know, we've taught our TB nurses how to check glucosis, how to check hemoglobin A1C, and they do that regularly in our clinic. It's routine now. But on top of that, we've created an educational flip chart uh, that uh, discusses both TB issues and diabetes issues so that when DOT is given and our DOT worker is sitting at the kitchen table uh, delivering TB meds, there's a discussion that begins with TB but often ends with diabetes. And the nice thing is that probably there's a multiplier effect because uh, when they do the DOT, uh, the mom is there, the children may be there, grandma may be there. So that diabetes education is a family education, not just for the patient that has tuberculosis. Now, okay, you've been involved with uh, preventive treatment for multidrug resistant TB and for TB. But what is it that you've, you've demonstrated? Well, we um, had a, a population of islanders in Chuuk, Micronesia, that were household contacts to uh, what turned out to be over 40 uh, MDR uh, TB cases. So many of them were children, they were definitely exposed. Uh, we tested them, they tested positive for latent TB. And a decision was made to do our best to provide them with some preventive treatment using sort of a best practices approach because there really are no guidelines for us to do this at this point. So we spent a year delivering the medication to those uh, high-risk individuals, and we found that uh, none of them have uh, come down with uh, MDR-TB now six years later. And was that monotherapy, or was it a, a regimen with a mixture of drugs? It was usually, uh, for most of the uh, cases, it was two drugs, but for some it was monotherapy. Uh, but all of them, it was a fluoroquinolone, which I think was uh, essential for this effort. Now, your numbers were relatively small, but what kind of statement could you make about the efficacy of this approach? Yeah, the, the, the work was set up to test the feasibility and the tolerability and the safety of providing preventive treatment. And in that regard, I think all of those three were pretty well demonstrated. They were safe, well tolerated. And the, the teams are in the households anyway, treating the mothers and the adults, and so treating the children with preventive medicine is quite doable. In terms of efficacy, it, we didn't really have the numbers we needed to prove that, uh, that it was efficacious, but we do know this, of the patients we treated, none of them got MDRTB, and again now we're six years out. But for the patients who either refused uh, the preventive treatment, or patients who were not identified till many years later, uh, many of them got MDRTB, up to 20 of them got uh, MDRTB. So we're pretty confident that uh, the treatment worked well. Well, in the real world, real world setting, it may not be ready for prime time, but what are your recommendations? Uh, again, uh, the recommendations from uh, WHO are still not there yet in terms of, uh, of asking all programs to do this. And there are some issues that were special to the islands. We had resources to do this. Um, and the risk for reinfection from another MDR-TB patient in 
Chuuk in Micronesia was pretty small. But we do think that in a household where there's an MDR case anywhere in the world, and there's a vulnerable patient, maybe a child under age five or an adult with diabetes, that MDR preventive treatment has a place uh, for TB control going forward. And if I can get you to summarize just in a few seconds, your findings and, and your recommendations coming out of both the TB and diabetes work that you've been involved with and talking about today, and also this uh, latent uh, infection and the attitude towards preventing it, how would you state that very briefly? Well, we're, really, we're very excited about uh, the movement to uh, integrate uh, a diabetes care with, into TB clinics. I think our patients deserve it, and our, and our, and our programs are very much capable of helping our patients to improve their diabetes control while we are curing their tuberculosis. So in that regard, uh, I, th I believe that uh, the Pacific is sort of leading the way for many other areas that have uh, serious diabetes problems, particularly in India, in, in China, and in other places in Southeast Asia. For uh, treating individuals with um, exposure to MDR, I think that uh, the summary would be that uh, the work is uh, not too difficult, that a program whose resource challenge can still handle it, that it's safe, and that we feel it's likely to be quite effective. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.